And today we have Larry Mize, the 1987 Masters champion with us. Larry is a native of Georgia. How were you playing as you came into the Masters? How were you, as you drove up Magnolia Lane on that Monday or Tuesday, how were you feeling about your game? Well, I was feeling good. Uh, my game was in good form. Uh, I'd, I'd come off a nice week from the Players' Championship uh, a couple of weeks before and uh, felt really good coming back into the tournament. And one thing that kind of carried over from the previous year, at Sunday of 86, I shot 65, my best round at that time at Augusta, to guarantee my position back in the tournament the next year to make top 24. And so, you know, that also added to my good feelings coming back to where I'd finished off the tournament good last the previous year. And uh, that, that and I felt good coming in with my game this year. That year when you when you in 87, the condition of the golf course, the press referred to it as extreme. Um, do you have much recollection of what the condition? Obviously, you thought it was in perfect condition. But, uh, I just, <laughs> well, uh -huh. I did. I mean, it, it was tough conditions. I I felt like they were good for me. I've never been a long ball, you know, never been a long hitter. Uh, so the course was playing firm and fast. So that was good for me. You know, the ball was running out in the fairway, so my, I could sneak it out there a little farther. The greens were hard and fast, and uh, so it was playing very difficult. And, and I, I've always liked difficult golf courses, so I think it played really good for me. But it was, uh, it was playing very tough that year. As I recall, 1982, I think they made a change in the rule with respect to caddies at Augusta, and you were able to bring in your own caddy. Was it your regular tour caddy that you brought in, or was it somebody else uh, that was with you that week? Yeah, I brought in my regular tour caddy. Uh, his name was Scott Steele. Uh, we'd started together in uh, 85, was our first year together. So, you know, this is our third year at, at, at Augusta, and uh, Scotty was, uh, he was, he's, Good friend, he was a good caddy, and uh, he was he was a help that week. There's no doubt. So the the uh, Thursday starts. Um, walk me through just some of your recollections, if you would, of the earlier rounds. Who you were paired with? Anything that was notable in a particular hole? Um, you know, just kind of the general as you get towards that Sunday afternoon, uh, kind of as momentum started to build on your side. Yeah, you know, Thursday I played with John Cook. Uh, and John Cook and I both played nice rounds. Uh, I remember um, I remember finishing the round off really well. I uh, birdied the last two holes, birdied 17 and 18 to shoot two under. And I remember 18, the pin was back up top on that top tier, and I was down below. And I made a nice, you know, 30-footer from down below to make another birdie to shoot the two under 70 of the first round. So, uh I felt uh, felt really good. Uh, I shot 70. John Cook shot 69. He was leading, thereby once again showing how hard the course was playing. 69 was leading after the first day. I shot 70 and was in second place, and uh, played with John again on Sat uh, Friday because back in those days they repaired after every round. So mm -hmm. John and I were repaired together because he was first, I was second, and uh, we won't last off on Friday, which was which was a lot of fun. I mean, it's kind of, you know, even more stressful because you're in the last group already on Friday. Um, but it was fun uh, playing in the last group. I, I shot 72. I shot even par. Um, but I can remember being on the 15th green and that, that green, you know, the, the fairway slopes down to the green. And uh, looking back up the fairway, they already had the mowers out since we were the last group. <laughs> we were coming down the fairway, you know, you had those mowers, about eight of them across coming down the fairway, getting it all ready for the next day. And, uh, it was kind of interesting, uh, you know, seeing that uh, on, in the last group. But that's how the first two days went. And I think I was uh, still in good shape, maybe just one back. Curtis Strange might have been leading. I'm, I'm not exactly sure, but I was still in good shape after two days. And uh, you, go into the, you go into the weekend, uh, continue to play well. And I think you were around par every day or under par. I think you said 72 on Friday, but you were under par uh, on Saturday. Um, uh, no, I actually shot 72 again. Um, I, I, I shot 72 again. I played with uh, Corey Pavin. Corey and I are good friends. We played together on Friday, on Saturday. And Saturday was a, there was a pivotal point on Saturday in Amen Corner, which, you know, Amen Corner always yeah. plays a pivotal role with that golf tournament. But it, it played a big role for me on Saturday because after 11 holes, I was two over par. So now I'm back to even par for the mm -hmm. tournament. 
and I hit my tee shot on the par three, the 12th hole in the pond short, which obviously is not what you want to do. So I, I dropped it, hit a sand wedge on the green about 10 feet and was able to make that putt for par. I mean, for bogey, mm -hmm. which was a very big putt to make bogey there and not double. So now I'm three over and one over for the tournament. Uh, so, but from there, I, I birdied 13 and I birdied 18. I made another birdie in there somewhere, but I played three under par from 13 on in to get back to even par for the day and two under for the tournament to kind of get myself back in contention. So that was a big finish for me and a lot of momentum going into Sunday's round as well. So there was a photo that we uh, shared with you earlier. It was yourself and Mark's uh, father on the range. Now, do you recall if that would have been taken on the Sunday morning and or was it earlier in the week and uh, Mr. Barnes was giving you some advice? Uh, do you recall what that maybe was about? Well, it was definitely it was earlier in the week. Um, I'm, I'm not sure exactly what it is. I've got that yeah. photo in my in my yeah. house as well. It's hung up on the wall. It's a very uh, I, I, means a lot to me, that photo, because Mr. Luke Barnes was a was a big help for me. And uh, I, I thought the world of him. I know that week. Uh, one of the things we did is we got the ball a little farther up in my stance. I can still remember Mr. Barnes saying, the man who's won here six times, he hits that ball really high, brings those irons in there high and soft, obviously talking about Jack Nicklaus. So made sure I moved the ball up to get those balls up in the air. Greens were really firm that week, as we talked about. So he wanted me to hit that, hitting those irons high and bringing them in soft because, you know, the, the greens at Augusta are, are big enough but the spots where you want to land it is very small, even though yep. the putting, putting surface is a big surface, but you've got to be very accurate with your irons. So we really worked on getting that ball up in my stance to get those irons up in the air and uh, get it high and soft. And also moving the driver up, I think I was able to really move the ball out there pretty good for me. I was hitting it pretty long for me that week. And uh, the funny thing is I really – couldn't draw the ball much and mr barnes mm. he, he liked that anyway he didn't want me fight, he didn't want me fighting that ball to the left but mm. uh i could be very aggressive with it and not worry about the left shot so i could be very aggressive off the tee and with all my shots because i didn't feel like i was going to lose it left so we were working on all that kind of stuff we were on the range and uh you know obviously he helped me and it turned out great so you've talked touched on the uh, course condition, the extreme nature of it as it was at uh, your very difficult conditions. Any thoughts as it relates to this year's uh, uh, tournament uh, being held in November and potential course condition that players will encounter? Well, I was talking to my dad after they announced the possibility of playing in November and he said, you know, they were, the news stations were talking about comparing the weather and what he told me was, you know, November, the early part of the week was the temperatures were pretty close. Maybe later in the week, it might have been a few degrees cooler in November than in April. But I think it's probably the best time of year to get similar conditions. Uh, you know, the, the rumor was October earlier. They were possibly doing it. Who knows if that was true or not. But October, it can still be pretty warm in Georgia. Uh, but November is normally a really good month. I think it can resemble April quite a bit. And uh, the rye grass uh, should be really good and thick in the fairways. So it should be a similar condition uh, in the fairways and around the green. And, you know, the nights will be cooler, so they shouldn't have any trouble with those greens. Not that Augusta would have any trouble with them anyway. <laughs> they, they, can, they can take care of that. But uh, I think it should be very similar. Uh, I think the biggest difference will be, uh, you know, the, the blooms. There just won't be any uh, yep. azaleas and dogwoods blooming in November. Maybe that's the challenge for Augusta National: how to get the azaleas to bloom in November. Um, <laughs> yeah. It would be a, it would be a good one. Yes, um, it would. So I I know that you've recounted your uh, that marvelous uh, chip shot on eleven many times, and can you provide just one more rendition of it for us and how it played out? I've watched the video any number of times uh, in preparation for speaking to you, but I mean, you just you you wore your success on your on your sleeve when it went in, as you were completely entitled to do. But I'd just love to hear it from uh, from yourself, exactly kind of how it played out in your own mind's eye and and uh, the way the crowd reacted and just the, 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 the next few hours after that as to if you remember anything of it. <laughs> oh, yeah, it's uh, hard to forget that. Um, you know, number, hard to forget it, number one. And number two, people do uh, bring it up. So I, uh, 
I never get tired of talking about it. Obviously, it's a great, <laughs> great time for me. But, you know, I'd hit a poor second shot out to the right. Uh, you know, it's about 100 feet. They, I remember they asked me afterwards in the press room. They said they saw it was about 140 feet. And I said, OK, fine. I, did, I was so excited. I didn't <laughs> care. But someone went out later and said it was about, you know, 99 feet, actually. So I just used 100. So I think that's about right. It's about 100 feet. And, you know, as I walked down there, Greg had hit his second shot on the right fringe. So I kind of felt like, well, let's, you know, just let's get down there and hit a good shot, put some pressure back on Greg. And my caddy, Scott Steele, had, had said to me, no biggie, kind of like he did to me all week. It's OK. We'll be all right. No biggie. Trying to make sure keep me calm. And when I went down there and looked at it, um, the best part about the shot was there was only one shot you could play. Uh, you know, in golf, the worst thing you can do is not be committed to the shot, be indecisive and, and not really fully commit. Well, this one was pretty easy to commit to because I felt like I couldn't land it on the green. The greens were too hard and fast, sloping toward the water, go in the pond. And I couldn't use anything less lofted than a sand wedge. All I had at that particular time was my 56 degree. And uh, anything with less loft I thought was going to be too hot running up there. Mm -hmm. So it's a shot that I practice. I think everybody practices at Augusta, the pitch and run, trying to bump it through that rye grass. It's a lot of times a little sticky around the greens because a lot of times you can't land it on the greens. Uh, so I picked out the spot where I wanted to land it short of the green. And I, I knew the break from uh, earlier. I, I mean, I knew it anyway, but I'd made about a 18 or 20 footer on that same line for par and regulation. So uh, I just said hit a good aggressive shot, uh, get it around the hole and give myself a really short bar par putt and put the pressure back on Greg. And, you know, I'll, I'll never forget hitting the shot. I, I hit the spot I was looking at and I just kind of stood there frozen, um, you know, watching it. I always wish I could see the my face. I'm sure my eyes got about as big as golf balls. Um, <laughs> the only the, the only thing is from behind. So uh, so I just watched it, watched it. And, you know, people say, when did you know it was going in? I said, I wasn't taking anything for granted. I watched it the whole way and it looked good. It looked good. It looked good. And, you know, then it went in the hole and, you know, people ask me, how'd you feel for, after the shot? And I go, well, kind of like you said, I, I wore my emotions on my sleeve. I kind of threw my club up in the air, jumped up, yeah. ran around, and I was screaming. Just a total, <laughs> totally laced. I mean, it was just total excitement uh, of that. And I just uh, ran up there and the people were screaming and yelling, which was exciting for me. And, uh, you know, then I just I picked the ball up out of the hole and, uh, you know, put my hands up to quiet the crowd down because we need to be respectful for Greg yeah. and give him a chance to make the putt. And I had to, uh, to wait for him to, uh, you know, See if he made the putt. And, you know, I, I've, I've learned in golf that, you know, you have to always expect the worst. Uh, I was in a playoff the previous year at the Kemper Open and at 90, 86 with Greg. And I thought I had him on the first hole and he made about a 12 or 15 footer for par. And five holes later on the sixth playoff hole, he beat me. So this time I was expecting him to make it, prepared to go to the 12th mm -hmm. tee. And, you know, but he didn't make it. And he came over and congratulated me like the champion he is. And, uh, then the golf cart took my wife, Bonnie, and our youngest son, our oldest son, David, who was just short of a year, up to Butler's cabin for the, uh, for the green jacket ceremony. <laughs> and so you, you referenced the green jacket. Nowadays, it seems that there's a reasonably strong publicity tour with the green jacket after uh, the Masters, whether it's up to New York for late night shows or whatever. Was that the case back then? I don't seem to recall. Uh, it wasn't for me. I know that. I mean, I, I was on the Today Show, the more, maybe, I don't know if I was on both of them, but I was on one of the one or both the morning shows on uh, Tuesday morning. Uh, but I didn't wear my jacket, you know, in hindsight, maybe I should have. I mean, I had it with me because when you're the reigning champion, you get to take the jacket with you and keep it. And then when you come back and defend it, it stays at the club unless they will send it to you if you need it for some reason. But basically it stays at the club. But uh I never wore it. Uh, the only time I did wear it was uh, back in Columbus, Georgia, when I was back home later that year. They did honor me, and I, I wore the green jacket to the to the ceremony where they honored me, and that was the only time I wear it. Uh, unfortunately, I wish I'd have gone to Wimbledon that year or something to wear it. That would have been a lot of fun. <laughs> I, I still want to go to Wimbledon. I've never been there. I've got, I've got to get there one year. That's fun. <laughs> What, what, during that year, uh, recognizing you didn't have the green jacket with you, any particularly funny stories that, that you can recall from uh, being being introduced as the Masters champion or just uh, on all the hoopla that went along with winning a major? 
Well, it just took a while to get used to it, to used to winning the, uh, uh, the, uh, used to being called a master's champion i mean that was kind of wow i was <laughs> i think it made me nervous every time they announced me you know now <laughs> 1987 master's champion larry mize i don't remember anything uh specific um i do remember uh i i really felt for greg in this format uh, two yeah. weeks later at the houston open uh greg norman and curtis strange and i were playing together and i'll never forget on the 15th hole the par five i was off the green and i Sure enough, I chipped in for Eagle. And <laughs> I felt, I really felt bad for Greg, to ha- you know, because the crowd went nuts, you know, and yep. Curtis just was over there smiling, you know, because Curtis is who I played with on Sunday at Augusta yep. in the tournament. So, but that was kind of an interesting thing to happen uh, after that. And poor Greg had to see, see that again, which I did feel <laughs> for him. But uh, I can't remember anything other than just I had to really get used to being uh, announced okay. as a Masters champion uh, teeing off because it was, uh, it, it took a while for it to really sink in that I that I actually done it. So one of the reasons I think so many people love the Masters is because of all the tradition that's involved. Um, do you have any kind of in the intervening thirty two years uh, any traditional kind of Masters routine for the week, such as you know when you get there, family dinners, you know family members caddying in the par three. Is there anything that you kind of try to do year on year to create your own tradition around the Masters? Well, it is. It's, it's kind of like a family reunion for me uh, because all of my family, other than me, lives in Augusta, and we would always stay with my parents that week. And uh, you know, the kids came in, and now the kids are grown and married, and they still come in. And so, actually, two of my boys now live in Augusta with their wives. So it was kind of a a family reunion week where we had a great time. We'd have dinners uh, at, at Dad's house. You know, I had the champions dinner. Uh, Tuesday night, but uh, one Bonnie and I would always bring steaks with us, and Friday night would be my night to cook steaks. So uh, I would come back from the golf course and cook steaks. We'd have a nice dinner with the family. So just some uh, some great family times. Uh, you know, we really didn't eat out that. You know, it's eating out that week is tough. You know, it's it's packed. So we would just always eat in, and uh, sometimes we'd get takeout from somewhere, uh, but or we cook at home. So just a lot of good family memories uh, memories from that time, and I just look forward to it every year. Um, as far as preparation for the week, um, uh, I tried not to wear myself out. I mean, you really can wear yourself yeah. out preparing for the golf tournament. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a hilly golf course. Um, so, you know, you want to make sure you pace yourself. Um, and I, I've seen guys go in there and they'll play, you know, almost 36 holes a day before the tournament and they're just worn out by the weekend. So just pacing myself and, you know, always playing the par three is a lot of fun as well. Before that, so a lot of times I'd sometimes I don't play on Wednesday except the par three. Sometimes I'll play nine holes that morning. But it's more of a I've kind of gotten where it's more of a nine hole deal. I'll play uh, uh, nine holes on Monday, maybe 18 on Tuesday if I think I need to. And then nine holes on Wednesday in the par three and uh, just try and get myself ready because you just really don't want to. You know, it's the Masters, but you don't want to over prepare, which is very easy to do there. Yep. Yep. So you you touched on the champions dinner and do you recall what you had as the for your menu in 1988 at the champions dinner? I did. And uh, I had steak, uh, baked potato, green beans and a dinner roll. Uh, I, I kept it real simple. Of course, I'm a steak and potatoes guy, um, but I wanted to have something everybody would like. I didn't realize, not ever being there, obviously, that there was they could order a steak, a chicken, or a fish off the menu if they didn't, if they had a special diet. So they didn't have to eat the champion's dinner. But that's what I had. And then I had peach cobbler, being from Georgia, tried to do some mm-hmm. Georgia effect, peach cobbler a la mode for dessert. So it was a uh, it was it was a fun time, kind of a nervous time. I, w- I was pretty nervous that night. Um, I- I've enjoyed in, in, in what I've done now is when young guys do win, I enjoy telling them, hey, enjoy the night. You belong there just as much as anybody. Because I was probably a little on the nervous side, too nervous the first time, kind of feeling, you know, wow, I'm here, almost a little out of place, I hate to say it. Uh, but I try and let the young guys know you deserve it and you belong here. So, Because uh, it's a fantastic night. I mean, I look forward to it every year. And, uh, you know, I hope we can play the tournament in November. And just as much just to get to have that dinner in November. I just mm-hmm. hate to skip a year without that Denver dinner. It's very special. That's terrific. Now, how many years have you been on the Champions Tour at this stage? 
Um, this is my, uh, what is it, my 12th well, year, I guess. Yeah, I think it's my 12th year out there. And are you still enjoying that second career? You know, I really do. Uh, you know, I, I, the, the travel is getting old. Um, you know, I, I have one grandson that's two years old, and I'm, I'm going to have another one in a few weeks, another grandson. So I'm enjoying being home as well. So I still enjoy playing, but I'm, I'm starting to cut back a little bit. Instead of playing 22, I'd like to play more like 15 events. And because uh, I still, you know, the competitive juices are still flowing. They're not they're not burning as bright as they used to, but I still enjoy it. And uh, I've gotten this year off to a better start. I've had I've had a few good weeks. So uh, I'm working hard to you know play for a few more years, which I'd like to. That's that's terrific. Well, Larry, it's been very kind of you to spend some time uh, with us. And I think that uh, anybody that listens to this will get a better sense of uh the quality gentleman that you are and, and what, you, what you accomplished in your week at Augusta back uh, 33 years ago. So thank, thank you very much. Well, thank you, Gordon. You're very kind. It was good to be with you. Thank you, sir. Take care. You too.